Good morning, and uh, thank you for joining us this morning for Winship Grand Rounds. Uh, if you are an Emory University or healthcare employee and you would like to receive a CME credit hour for attending today, uh, the login information can be found in the chat feature on the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you have any issues with this webinar or the CME login, uh, please send Julie Hawkins an email or drop a note in the Zoom chat box. Uh, this morning, we are really excited to welcome Dr. Edith Mitchell. Uh, Dr. Mitchell is professor in the Department of Medicine at uh, Sydney Kimmel Medical College uh, of the Thomas Jefferson University. Uh, she's also Associate Director for Diversity Programs and the Director of the Cancer to Eliminate Cancer Disparities. Uh, she has spent her medical career helping individuals in medically underserved areas to realize that simple changes in lifestyle can have a dramatic impact on cancer care. Uh, she received a Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry from Tennessee State University and a medical degree from the Medical College of Virginia in Richmond. In 1973, while attending medical school, uh, Dr. Mitchell entered the Air Force and received a commission through the Health Professions uh, Scholarship Program. Uh, she subsequently entered active duty after completion of her internship and residency in internal medicine at Mihari Medical College. And this was followed by a fellowship in medical oncology at Georgetown University. Uh, she is a retired U.S. Air Force Brigadier General having served as the Air National Guard Assistant to the Command Sergeant uh, for U.S. Transportation Command and Headquarters, uh, the Air Mobility Command based at the Scott Air Force Base in Illinois. Uh, General Mitchell has been awarded with over 15 military service medals and ribbons. As a distinguished researcher, she has received many, many cancer research and uh, principal investigator awards including a recent promise grant from the Susan G. Komen Foundation. Uh, she serves on the NCI Review Panel, uh, the Cancer Investigations Review Committee, uh, the Clinical Trials and Translational Research Advisory Committee, the NIH Council of Councils, and as co-chair of the NCI Disparities Committee. Uh, because of her experience in the cancer research community, Dr. Mitchell was selected to serve as a member of the NCI's Blue Ribbon Panel, conveyed to advise the National Cancer Advisory Board on Vice President, now President-elect, Biden's National Cancer Moonshot Initiative. And in 2019, Dr. Mitchell began service as a member of the President's Cancer Panel. A research in breast, colorectal, and pancreatic cancers, uh, and all the GI malignancies involve new drug evaluation and chemotherapy, uh, development of new therapeutic regimens, chemoradiation strategies for combined modality therapy, patient selection criteria, and supportive care for patients with GI cancers. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mitchell. So good morning, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lace, for that introduction. My mother would be very proud. So thank you so much, and thank you, uh, the audience, for joining us today. I selected the topic, Improved Survival, but Continued Disparities in Cancer, Planning the Future with Precision Oncology, but Assessing the Past Through the Rearview Mirror. Um, and I am delighted to present today. My disclosures, I have none related to this topic. Um, the poet James Baldwin said, know from whence you came, if you know whence you came, there are absolutely no limitations to where you can go. That is particularly important today as we uh, evaluate the COVID-19 pandemic and the effect on uh, disparities, uh, not only in the disease process for COVID-19. However, we must remember that cancer 
does not pull up to a stoplight and stop uh, regarding the incident or mortality rates. And therefore, we must continuously address these issues as we move through uh, therapeutic and treatment plans for uh, the pandemic. So my objectives today will be to describe the decline in cancer mortality rates, historical events that have impacted cancer outcomes, the impact of Medicare and cancer disparities, and disparities in breast, colorectal, and multiple myeloma. I selected these three, but there are multiple other uh, disease processes and cancers where we can say ditto, uh, there are disparities, and therefore we must address these in our cancer programs um, and in our overall community engagement for healthcare. And I will finalize with some future directions in cancer research. It is well recognized that non-Hispanic black males have the highest cancer incidence and mortality rates in this country compared to other racial and ethnic groups. Uh, note for the non-Hispanic uh, black male, uh, there is the highest incidence rate. There is also the highest cancer mortality rate in this country. Uh, for non-Hispanic white females, um, there is the highest cancer incidence rates. However, non-Hispanic black females have the highest death rates. So um, note that non-Hispanic whites, the highest incidence rate, uh, but non-Hispanic black females having the highest mortality rates from cancer in this country. And while we have talked about cancer uh, incidents and mortality rates over many decades, note uh, that there has been a decline in um, overall cancer incidence rates in this country, but note that uh, black men in red here have still, uh, despite our um, efforts and our accomplishments over multiple decades, the African-American male still has the highest uh, cancer incidence rate. Uh, and mortality, again, over many decades of research and involvement of many individuals and institutions in this country note that the African-American male uh, still has highest incidence and highest mortality rates. Um, there are a number of factors that have affected uh, the cancer programs over many years. Um, being initiated by the Na National Cancer Act of December uh, 23rd, 1971, when it was signed by uh, then President Nixon. And that established the National Cancer Institute, uh, the National Cancer Advisory Board, and other programs, um, including our National Cancer Centers Program, which your institution here at Emory and my institution at Jefferson are recipients of uh, the programs of the National Cancer uh, Designated Cancer Programs. Um, and then we have the cooperative groups, which uh, I am proud to work with many people from Emory uh, in the uh, Eastern Cooperative Group, Akron uh, Cancer Re uh, Research Group. We also have the surveillance epidemiology and in results as we know it as the SEER program that provides research information for many institutions, including uh, Emory and Jefferson for uh, data on cancer research. Um, my friend, Dr. Harold Freeman provided me this slide um, and his um, um, work has shown that uh, 
yes, we have the gene environment, but there are social determinants of health that can affect gene expression and therefore uh, contribute to uh, cancer disparities. That is social injustice, poverty and low socioeconomic status and culture. And therefore, if we are to be successful in our cancer programs, uh, decreasing overall mortality rates, we've got to focus on a number of factors, including prevention, early detection, diagnosis and incidence, treatment, uh, post-treatment quality of life, um, and survival and, and mortality. But important in this area is that of uh, development of not only uh, disease recurrence, but uh, secondary or other uh, cancers. So consequently, we must uh, have all of these areas included in our uh, cancer plans. So what are some of the causes? Well, there's certainly differences in the prevalence of screening uh, and the quality of screening and the number of individuals uh, treated, uh, as well as the quality of treatment. And I mention here uh, clinical trials because it is well recognized that uh, many minority communities um, do not participate in clinical trials or maybe, and I shouldn't say do not participate, in many cases, they're not offered clinical trials. So therefore our programs must make sure that in our community engagement, we are reaching the right population and making sure that population has the right treatment at the right time and the most appropriate treatment, uh, including participation in clinical trials. So we should stop talking about people don't participate. What we have to talk about is whether our research plan includes that population and um, the racial and ethnic uh, groups that are in our communities. Uh, we also know that there are differences in um, cancer incidents uh, in uh, certain races, such as triple negative breast cancer, uh, prostate cancer, and others. Uh, the socioeconomic status of the patient and certainly the region of residence in this country. Um, the double AMC has become uh, an active, very active uh, proponent of uh, diversity and published a few years ago that if you look at individuals 18 years and older, note that 68% of individuals are white. If you look at those under 18, however, uh, that number decreases to 56%. And it is estimated that in just a couple of decades, um, this number will be below 50%. And therefore our cancer programs must address the cancer incidence and mortality uh, rates in minority communities because minority communities will represent more than 50% of the population in the United States. So we've got a job to do. Uh, it's important that we increase uh, our workforce diversity. Uh, there are studies showing that African-American physicians in this country represent only about 5%, uh, oh, I'm sorry, about 5% yet African-Americans constitute uh, approximately 13% of the overall population. So we must uh, find opportunities, develop strategies to increase the uh, workforce diversity uh, so that we've got more people in our communities uh, carrying the message, doing the work, and therefore increasing the number of minority patients uh, in uh, the population. 
Uh, these are data from just 2018 showing that uh, for African Americans, 5% um, of doctors in this country practicing are uh, African Americans. Now, as a part of the overall strategies in working together, uh, ACGME is also involved and anyone in clinical medicine in this country uh, has gone through uh, an ACGME um, program. And note that this comes directly from ACGME just published um, recently, that we must ev um, evaluate and participate in not only diversity and inclusion, we've had these topics for many years, but what we really want to do is make sure that as we look at our diversity and inclusion programs, we include the outcomes and the outcomes are related to equity. And ACGME indicates that first of all, we've got to accept the problem, uh, acknowledge and contextualize that this is an issue and accept it and own it. Then we must use our uh, techniques, our programs to uh, act, uh, build tools, uh, use these tools, make sure that we are accounting and evaluating processes. And all of this should focus on the fact that equity matters. And we've got to include that in all of our programs. Uh, ACGME also uh, says that we must use our strategies to develop innovation um, mechanisms. And once developed, we can't just say we've done this and that. We've got to make sure that they are implemented and that they are effective um, in uh, the evaluation process. So um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And equity actually de <clears throat> determines the outcomes. So what do we mean by this? If we look at inequality, we note that there are two people here represented. Uh, one is receiving apples and the other is asking, how can I um, play the game? Uh, we can develop processes where we give each some advantages, but still the individual on the right, uh, even though the two ladders are equal, um, this person is still uh, having difficulty uh, reaching apples. So uh, we have also developed programs where we give some additional resources and maybe a taller ladder and this person is actually able to reach some of the apples. Uh, but note this, this person still has the advantage of more apples. So what we really need to do is focus on justice and prop up this tree so it's not bending in the direction of um, individuals. Um, we also must um, use the fact that we've got to prop up the tree so it's not bending away from certain individuals so that everyone has the opportunity for receiving the benefit of our programs, not only training programs, but treatment programs as well. We've got to make sure that there is not only equality and equity, um, but also, I'm sorry, uh, but also making sure that everyone has the opportunity. And yes, we may have to give some additional resources to certain individuals in order to uh, make sure that they are participants um, of the process. So we've got to make sure that our programs do not uh, offer disparities to individuals of certain races um, uh, 
uh, and um, groups, whether they are rural groups of patients or in the inner city or socioeconomically deprived, we've got to make sure that everybody is included and that we not only make sure that everybody is able to obtain apples, but if there are programs that um, offer disparities for individuals, we got to fix the tree and prop it up so that uh, we are eliminating cancer disparities. As we talk about the past, um, there are some individuals who are very important in terms of developing cancer programs throughout the country and over many decades. The first person I want to mention is Dr. Jane Cook Wright. Uh, years ago, many of us were given information on the fathers of uh, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, but nobody ever talked about the founding mother. Dr. Jane Cook Wright, an African-American physician, uh, was one of the seven original founding members of ASCO, and now ASCO having over 40,000 uh, members. So Dr. Jane Cook Wright. Dr. Wright was a uh, medical oncologist as al and also a laboratory researcher who was the first to indicate that we must study the cells of cancer in order to uh, make sure that we are reaching all populations and that cancers in certain individuals, and she worked uh, with African-Americans, uh, she was the first to indicate that some of the cancers in African Americans may be different from uh, those of uh, the white population. Dr. Jane Cook Wright, a founder of ASCO. And here is Dr. Wright. She participated in AACR and over the years uh, worked hard uh, against cancer. And she and her father were also. Um, um, individuals who conferred with uh, then President uh, Roosevelt. And here is Dr. Wright's father, who was a noted surgeon um, and also was president of the board of the NAACP for 18 years. And he is here with uh, First Lady, uh, then First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. On the other side are members of ASCO and the National Medical Association giving Dr. Wright and presenting her um, the um, Legacy Award uh, for Cancer uh, in this country, uh, Dr. Jane Cook Wright. Um, Medicare, and many ask, well, why do you put that in your talk? What does Medicare have to do with disparities? Um, President, Johnson, um, here signing the, the Medicare legislation, July 30th, 1965. And he chose not to sign it in the Oval Office, but he went to Kansas City, Missouri and signed the legislation in the um, uh, Truman Library. It was President Truman that first uh, approached Congress to develop a plan and a program for uh, providing care to the elderly in this country. And that eventually uh, led to uh, the Medicare legislation. And uh, we note that in 1970, approximately 20 million individuals received care through Medicare. But note, it is estimated by 2030 that number will have quadrupled and more than 81 million individuals will have access to medical care through Medicare. And what did that have to do with disparities? Well, the Medicare legislation, as I said, was signed uh, July 30th, 1965. Uh, the Civil Rights Act had been signed a year prior to that. And the civil rights uh, legislation included the fact that individuals or institutions could not receive federally funded 
uh, resources unless there was adherence to the Medicare um, or, or to the Civil Rights Act. And we, maybe some don't remember, that there were hospitals, physicians' offices in many areas, not only in the South, uh, but they were in Philadelphia too, uh, with signs saying, um, colored for one door and whites only at the other door. Um, within four months, those signs all changed. There were hospitals that did not allow black doctors to be members of the staff. Uh, that changed. Uh, in many hospitals, black nurses only took care of black patients on the black wards and were not allowed to uh, provide care on the whites only um, medical wards. This all ended and by July uh, of uh, 1966, when the uh, legislation actually went into uh, service and production, uh, all those signs came down. Uh, black doctors were allowed on um, hospital wards. And that occurred here in Atlanta, uh, in my hometown uh, near Memphis, Tennessee. Same thing, all of this changed. So reduced uh, disparities in access to care by enforcement of the Civil Rights Act was a condition of hospital and institutional participation. Hospitals integrated their medical staff's waiting rooms uh, very quickly. And not only that, let's remember outcomes. Hospitalizations for whites and blacks increased uh, while uh, the increase was higher for blacks uh, being admitted to the hospitals for care. And disparities in access to hospital services uh, changed and the difference in the hospitalization rates between whites and blacks uh, decreased. So the gap between services uh, decreased immediately uh, with that. I've been interested in racial differences in cancer care for many years. And my colleague, Robin Hertz, and I um, wrote this booklet. One of the things that we found was differences in the payment for cancer care. In our research, we noted that for ages 40 to 64, uh, note that whites had higher uh, uh, volume or incidence of payment by private insurance, and uh, only about 3.5% used Medicaid from the data uh, for payment of services for cancer. Yet in the black population, only 62% had private insurance and the Medicaid payment rate was 21.1%. Um, and that was expected because of um, employment. But in the group 65 and older with access to Medicare, uh, you would think that uh, this number would be very different, but note the differences between Medicare funding for cancer and Medicare um, uh, in Blacks. So the difference is still significant and with a higher number of Blacks um, having access to cancer care through Medicaid. Note the difference is 14.9% for Blacks for Medicaid and less than 1% for Whites. So all is not equal uh, in terms of payment for cancer care. Um, yet, if we note um, 1900 to 2017 and the uh, decline, first the increase in cancer death rates, there has been a persistent decline in uh, cancer death rates. And over, a three, over this period, a 29% decline in cancer death rates in this country. Yet, when we look over a long period of time, uh, note that non-Hispanic Blacks still have the highest um, mortality rates of any racial or ethnic group.
in this country. And um, the stage distribution of individuals for a number of cancers uh, demonstrate the fact that um, there are higher death rates in cancers, even if they present with early stage disease or late stage disease. So it's not just African Americans or others, uh, minorities presenting with late stage disease. Even in early stage disease, uh, there, is, uh, uh, there are higher mortality rates. Clinical trials, very important. Uh, and one important event, the NIH revitalization uh, rate of 1993, our act of 1993, uh, called for valid subset analyses among races and ethnicities. And therefore, we must include this information in uh, NCI-sponsored clinical trials. And I recommend that this be done in all clinical trials. Uh, no matter uh, who or what institution is the supporting um, and resources factor. So we've got to look at what we're doing. And if we look at a number of disease processes, uh, breast, prostate, uh, colorectal cancer, note that the African-American population has the highest uh, mortality rate. So we've got to focus on all of the cancers and make sure that we have appropriate information uh, and that we include those communities in our clinical trials process. So um, with data collected from the American Cancer Society, it's well recognized that the South has a higher uh, incidence rates and higher mortality rates, and, th and that the decline uh, varies tremendously according to uh, the area of the country. Note that the area of the Northeast has the, uh, the higher Northeast has the highest rate of decline of cancer. So you could say well, maybe we should all move to Vermont or New Hampshire or Maine, um, Maine Massachusetts, uh, and then the rates would be lower. Uh, there are still lots of studies ongoing uh, in all of the states to try and address the issue of uh, cancer incidence and mortality rates. Uh, so let's focus on the three cancers that I mentioned. Uh, the breast cancer burden of African Americans. What do we know? We know that there is a higher mortality rate from breast cancer in African Americans. Uh, more African American women uh, present with late stage disease. And until very recently, uh, there were lower uh, lifetime incidence rates, but they have, uh, the curves have approximated each other now. Uh, Af in the African-American population, women present with breast cancer at a younger age. There is an increased frequency of adverse tumor features. And I added this that uh, there's a higher incidence of male breast cancer in African-American. And these are some of the uh, areas that we think perhaps contribute to these disparities identified, and therefore very important uh, for study and clinical trials uh, involving uh, patients. Uh, this was from Jefferson and one of my former residents um, and later uh, fellows um, and young faculty uh, conducted this investigation with uh, evaluation of the uh, tumors of more than uh, 2,000 uh, women with breast cancer and found that patients had, um, with these tumors and all uh, from our institution, had lower uh, estrogen receptor positivity, 
uh, but a much higher T67. And this was the one of the earlier reports of T67 being important in um, breast cancer tumor uh, pathology evaluation. Uh, and she also found in this group that triple negative breast cancers were more commonly seen in the African-American uh, patients. Um, the stage distribution by receptor status and race has been studied on uh, many, um, uh, through many programs uh, and research efforts. And note that uh, the tumors or the patients with these tumors are, HR, are HER positive and hormone receptor positive uh, had the best um, uh, overall survival rates, uh, but African-Americans had a lower incidence rate of these um, uh, tumors with the best prognostic factors. And for triple negative breast cancer, note that African-Americans had almost twice the number of triple negative breast cancers which are known to have a worse prognosis and overall uh, pathologic features uh, that uh, contributed to a survival from breast cancer. Um, also, uh, it had been implied that um, uh, postmenopausal women had a, low, a higher incidence of hormone receptor positive tumors but note that whether patients are less than 40 when they develop breast cancer or over 75, that um, Black Americans have a higher incidence of triple negative breast cancer. And of course, in individuals over 75, it's well recognized that there could be other comorbidities uh, that might affect treatment. And therefore, uh, for this group over age 75, with perhaps other comorbidities, and in addition, um, triple negative breast cancer, that this offers a particular uh, challenge to the treatment process. And therefore, we must continue to evaluate the um, aging population, and also make sure that our treatments are designed to include all of the factors that may be involved in uh, care of the elderly population. Um, so breast cancer, many disparities that must be addressed. Multiple myeloma is another. Uh, as I served as the co-chair of the NCI uh, diversity Committee. Um, I was very adamant about multiple myeloma being included in the uh, disparate cancers. And what you note is that the rate of incidence in myeloma is almost twice that of other racial and ethnic groups. So therefore, myeloma in the African-American population, a particular uh, problem. And of course, your team at Emory has been a major uh, proponent of research in myeloma and also in the work and leadership in the um, uh, ecog Akron cancer research group efforts. What we know from myeloma incidence rates is that in Black patients, Myeloma increases earlier in age. In the uh, 30s, you can see differences, and those differences continue to increase between racial and ethnic uh, groups in this country with um, the aging of the population. And this just goes over to show that this continues even through um, the age group over 80. So myeloma, another disparate um, disease process. And the mortality from myeloma, again, nearly twice 
the mortality rate of other racial and ethnic groups in this country. So myeloma, another disparate cancer that we must find uh, some answers to, not only the incidence rate, but the mortality rates. It is well recognized that MGUS, which is a predisposing factor to um, myeloma, uh, there's a lot of research ongoing to understand this progression from MGUS to frank myeloma. Um, studies now show that MGUS uh, occurs at, an, at a higher rate in African Americans than in other racial groups. And therefore, uh, studying this um, population of patients with high MGUS. And it's also been recognized that even in the pediatric population, uh, there are children uh, that um, have MGUS on uh, studies. So this starts early in life. And as um, there is a progression to frank myeloma, uh, that African-Americans represent higher uh, groups in all of these stages in the development of myeloma. So studying this preliminary group now uh, is being addressed in research studies. So myeloma, another disparate tumor, and colorectal cancer, another showing that African-Americans have um, higher um, rates of colorectal cancer and higher um, mortality rates. Um, African-Americans have approximately a 20% higher incidence rate of um, developing colorectal cancer and a 40% higher mortality rate. With the African-American male having the highest, uh, 40, a black man developing um, colorectal cancer in the United States has a 47% higher chance of dying uh, than um, white men. So again, more studies needed. And this study from the University of Alabama uh, and the VA hospital there, where the patients are all cared for by the same group of surgeons. Uh, and they evaluated those patients with stage two and three colon cancer who did not receive uh, chemotherapy or other adjuvant therapy. And what they noted that black patients uh, were younger than the whites, more likely to be female, worse overall survival, five-year overall survival for blacks and whites uh, was 68 and 72%, and worse recurrence-free survival after um, surgical uh, care of the patients. And their conclusion was that black patients with resected stage two and three colon cancer who were treated with the same therapy as white patients uh, experienced worse overall survival and worse recurrence-free survival, uh, but similar recurrence-free intervals compared to the white patients. Um, screening an issue in colorectal cancer, in fact, uh, for all races, um, they have not met the goals of the American Cancer Society uh, for screening. But there is an issue related to younger patients. So these are the patients who are 50 years or older undergoing uh, screening processes. Note that the um, decrease in cancer incidence rates in the population over 50 but for those aged 20 to 49, um, there is a continued increase in um, cancer, colorectal cancer in this country. It has increased 51% since 1994. Uh, and uh, recognize that this is a big problem with rectal cancer increasing more than colorectal or, or colon cancer. Um, but that number 
is still uh, progressing in those individuals 20 to 49 years of age. And it has almost doubled uh, in, since 1990 uh, by 2015. So approximately 12% of um, colorectal cancers in this country are in individuals younger than age 50 who would not have been, uh, who have not, would not have had access to screening programs uh, then. And in 2020, it is expected that 12% of new cases will be uh, in this age group, 20 to 49, and that 7% of the deaths uh, will occur in this age group. Uh, there is a lot of research now uh, trying to understand the colorectal subtypes and the um, precision medicine uh, regarding colorectal cancer. So a lot of research, a lot of understanding, and therefore uh, not only do we need to collect the numbers on the patients with colorectal cancer, but we also need to look at the genomic profiles and the um, colorectal cancer subtypes uh, in populations. Uh, so we note for these three cancers that there are higher incidence and mortality rates and therefore must be addressed. And certainly the precision medicine uh, initiative has been one of the areas of research uh, that we have at our disposal to understand um, the molecular mechanisms of these tumors and that can help with targeted therapy for those three cancers such that we're giving the right therapy to the right patient at the right time and that with precision medicine, we can target uh, the tumors as well as recognize the healthcare delivery status of those populations. Um, for uh, another uh, research group from the NIH, uh, the All of Us mission and objectives, this is a research program to evaluate not only those with disease uh, ongoing processes, uh, but for those who may not have uh, evidence of disease to try and understand um, mechanisms of disease and more importantly, some preventive strategies that might allow uh, us to know more about these diseases. Uh, the All of Us program uh, is evaluating biological markers and a number of other uh, processes and uh, provided patients the first set of their data uh, just recently this fall, I believe it was November. So the All of Us program is trying to re improve health uh, by accelerating research. And this is not only imp important for individuals, it's important for the cancer centers uh, who will have access to this information for research. So the All of Us program. Another program that we are working with um, uh, Emory is that of the NCI Molecular Analysis for Therapy Choice, the NCI MATCH study, where um, genomic profiles within tumors are evaluated and medications are assigned uh, based on not the disease process, but the molecular markers uh, that are expressed in the tumors. So the NCI match study is continuously ongoing. Uh, there are about uh, 1,100 sites throughout the country and therefore uh, the opportunity for communities, rural communities, inner city communities, and others um, to uh, have access to the NCI match protocol, and therefore providing uh, patients uh, therapy. There are 39 separate treatment arms, and some have been completed uh, with enrollment final. We actually have some um, um, 
manuscripts that have been included and the main manuscript published in October uh, from ECOC Akron. So the match study, another very important uh, study. And these data are taken from the um, publication in October. So I encourage you to uh, find out more about the match study. Now the um, ACA uh, has been shown to influence ca cancer disparities in a positive way in that, and it was reported at uh, ASCO last year in 2019 uh, that those states with uh, Medicaid expansions um, had a greater, uh, gave a greater access to care to um, racial groups as well as all groups. And with the conclusion that implementation of Medicaid expansion differentially improved African-American cancer patients receipt of timely treatment. So therefore reducing uh, racial disparities in access to care and delay of um, therapeutic intervention. So ACA being important. For the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center at Jefferson, we have um, uh, reported that our work uh, to increase uh, minority participation in clinical trials depended on a number of factors, community outreach and education, developing partnerships and strategies within the community, making sure that we include our clinicians as well as basic science researchers and our behavioral and epidemiologic uh, science investigators all working together to increase accrual in our populations. And we have shown uh, that we can increase the um, participation of minority populations in clinical trials. So just a few summary points. Precision medicine initiative, very important. Cancer death rates continue to decline in the United States. Understanding disparities in cancer incidence and mortality rates and impact of social determinants of health are areas of research and we must focus on these in our community engagement endeavors. Important uh, to remember that there are historical contributions to the decline in cancer death rates and uh, the contributing factors I discussed earlier. Newer therapeutic research interventions and clinical trials participation uh, by all patients with cancer in this country is important, as well as understanding the genetic changes in tumors through genomic sequencing and other tests that will help us understand the disease processes with higher incidence rates in African Americans. It is not strictly related to people not receiving things and um, getting um, treatment. So uh, that is the end and I'm happy to uh, discuss others. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Uh, to the audience, please, if you have uh, any questions, uh, please use the question and answer, the Q&A feature. It's located, uh, I think, on the right uh, bottom corner of your screen. And uh, while we wait on uh, questions to come in, I wanted to also let everyone know that uh, the next uh, Grand Rounds is going to be on Wednesday, January 13. Uh, after the holiday break. And uh, we look forward to hearing from Dr. Tim uh, Showwater, uh, who is going to be presenting Innovation for Efficiency in Image Guided Brachytherapy. Uh, to view all upcoming Windship Grand Round lectures, uh, please visit the Grand Rounds page on the Windship Cancer Center website or the Windship uh, calendar. Uh, we have some questions already coming in. Uh, Dr. Lawson wants to know. Uh, in the states with uh, the best in decreases in overall mortality from cancer. 
uh, do the racial disparities persist? So the, um, thank you for that question. There are some racial uh, disparities, uh, but the gaps are closer in those northern states than in uh, the southern states, for example. So yes, some disparities do exist, uh, but there, uh, there, there is less expression and consequently the gaps in those areas are much less and in some states almost non-existent. And uh, I think this is a follow-up to the same question uh, from Dr. Uh, Nazar. Uh, he wants to know uh, your thoughts, uh, Dr. Mitchell, on studying the geographic differences in outcomes uh, within each of minority racial and ethnic groups and how this can inform uh, where state level policies are successful and where such policies need improvement. Uh, so yes, and there are um, um, descriptions of the states that have um, Medicaid expansion. And there are some states, as we know, uh, that do not have Medicaid expansion. And the greater number of those are in uh, the southern states. So Medicaid expansion through the uh, Affordable Care Act has proven uh, Im important um, uh, information. Thank you. Uh, this question is from Dr. Rama Lingam. Uh, thanks for the great talk, Edith. Uh, can you please comment on the uptake of risk reduction measures, such as tobacco cessation and HPV vaccination among minority patients? Um, the uptake is less. Let's look at HPV, for example. Uh, fewer African Americans have received vaccination uh, for HPV, and um, there is fewer um, um, uptake by actually some practitioners. So we not only need to reach the patient population, but uh, education processes for primary care physicians for the entire population on measures that have demonstrated success. So with the success of HPV and prevention of cervical cancer, we certainly need to, we, we've got a job in educating um, physicians as well as um, uh, the patient populations and parents because as you know, the uh, vaccination process uh, begins in childhood. Absolutely. And uh, another question from uh, Dr. Lawson. Uh, the adverse uh, childhood experiences study uh, showed an increased incidence of many diseases, including cancer, in adults with higher number of these experiences. Uh, should this data be woven into studies of disparities? Should we be incorporating more of the pediatric uh, disparities into the overall picture uh, when we discuss such topics? Oh uh, Yes, um, pedi um, the pediatric cancer groups and institutions uh, focused on cancers in children are very, very active. Uh, I uh, I'm not a pediatrician, but I can tell you that the pediatric groups uh, have um, done a better job of getting patients into clinical trials and treatment processes uh, than the adult um, uh, cancer groups. And uh, there are many reasons for that, um, including uh, the cancer centers and uh, those that are designated only for children. So, uh, and they're um, the children ages uh, below 18, of course, have fewer comorbidities and um, uh, other disease processes that can influence treatment. So, there are a number of factors, but the pediatric groups are very, very active. And yes, Black children do. Um, develop cancers, uh, as well as others, uh, other racial and ethnic groups. 
So again, very important to make sure that uh, care is provided to these individuals. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. I must tell you that I have another uh, program to present in a few minutes, but this has been great and it is so uh, wonderful. And I thank my colleagues at uh, Emory uh, for working with me on a number of processes. And Dr. Elise, you have been a part of that uh, effort. So uh, thanks to Emory. Thanks for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you today. If there are other questions in the chat, um, feel free to send them to me and we can address them later. Thank you but very thank much. you for allowing me this opportunity today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.